welcome to the Animal Training Academy Making Ripples podcast show, the show where we share the stories of the ripple-making extraordinaires with behavior nerd superpowers who make up the Animal Training Academy membership. I'm your host and one of the happiness engineers at Animal Training Academy, Shelley Wood from Drop Your Jaws Dog Training in Cape Girardeau, Missouri in the United States. We are absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss a single episode. This show is brought to you on behalf of the Animal Training Academy membership. So if you like the conversations in these episodes, then we want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people in the ATA membership, which you can find out more about at www.atamember.com. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help you problem solve your training challenges. And we are a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forums area. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. Today, we are excited to welcome Michaela Bentovim to the show. Michaela Bentovim has been a lifelong animal lover and horse professional, currently living among two miniature horses, two ponies, a mare, and two dogs. For the past eight years, Michaela attributes her major life change to the arrival of a miniature horse she named Toto. Together, they set on a journey of exploration and magical discoveries that changed their lives and the other members of her equine and canine family forever. Michaela and Toto traveled and visited kindergartens and other educational programs to educate and advocate on equine welfare. Toto and Michaela originated a therapy program in a few assisted living homes for the elderly, daycare for the disabled, and recently were invited to a local hospital. Today, Michaela owns and operates a program called Compassionate Communications with Animals, teaching human learners to utilize and improve their observational and communication skills. By harnessing human love and empathy for animals and the passion for a connection and bond, she motivates a more compassionate outlook on animal behavior, learning, and welfare. Michaela teaches humans of all ages, but specializes in teaching the practice of clicker training and cooperative care to toddlers and young children in creative ways. Michaela was an autodidact until she joined the generously knowledgeable ATA group, which helped put her and all her learners on the road to success. Michaela's biggest inspiration comes from Carolina Westland's wonderful courses, hoping to inspire others and create more ripples through upcoming lectures, seminars, and courses, both frontal and online. Michaela is also an artist for the past years and for the past years has also made custom ordered pyrography. Yes, pyrography. Uh, (laughs) Pet portraits (laughs) to support her animals. Michaela, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here today. I'm really, really grateful and honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I would love it if you would start us out by telling us your story. Tell us a little bit about how you started working with animals and the work that you're doing with them today. Well, actually, I've been I've been very lucky to have grown up among horses. I've been uh, with horses for 36 years since I was six years old. Uh, first as a rider and then um, as a trainer and uh, finally as a riding instructor. But um, uh, it, it, only like eight years ago, I made a, a very big change uh, with the arrival of a miniature horse that changed everything. So, And, uh, and then I uh, became what I am right now. <laughs> But um, I've been around animals all my life and always uh, was proud of uh, how I could connect with them. And I really wanted to gain more tools. And um, in the past few years, that's what I've been doing throughout my uh, work with them and and um, just being around them, learning them. So did you grow up with animals? Yes. My dad was a, a, a real big animal lover. So um, actually, I always had dogs, never had cats. My mom was afraid of them, but... <laughs> 
that I had a good exposure to to rabbits and horses since I was six. And dogs were uh, my main my main passion now growing up. And did you get to spend any time training animals when you were growing up, or were you just kind of living alongside them? Well, actually, um, I think. I think as a rider, I was training horses without even knowing I was training horses and not really knowing what I was doing <laughs> for sure for a few years. But um, yes, I think um, I think I've been influenced by a lot of the, you know, uh, mainstream uh, horsemanship and um, dog training, um, old fashioned dog training, classical training for a few years and tried it on my own pets and horses that uh, I worked with. But um, yeah, I only consider myself now a trainer while I I, I got myself some um, some education. <laughs> and what tell us a little bit about the animals who you live with today. You mentioned Toto quite a bit in your biography, but I know that you live with several other animals as well. Yes, I have a, a very eclectic collection of horses. I um, uh, ten years ago opened up a ranch and started collecting horses, and there there's a a, a huge story behind every one of them. But um, um, I've, uh, two of them have been with me for thirteen years, which which is amazing to 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 see a horse uh, grow up and change its colors. Actually. <laughs> Uh, my mare uh, was a fall, a four-month-old four, uh, fall when I met her, and she wasn't mine to begin with. But I, 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 I was there to watch her grow, and we made a, con- a connection right away. She was so curious when she was young, and uh, that connection just stayed with us for a few years until I, until I, you know, I decided I couldn't live without her, and I had to have her. <laughs> And that's it. She's been with me ever since. And how I think you just said this already, but how long ago was that that you decided you had to have that mare? She was born uh, 13 years ago. It took me um, I started training her for riding when she was three. And um, then he wanted to take her after I trained her, her owner. So I, I told her he can't because that's it. She's mine. She's like, it's like it's a known fact. We just bonded. You know, I can't part with her. So. So I was lucky. I was lucky he gave her up. <laughs> and um, and that mare, actually, she has a, a, a wonderful story of how you can take a bad situation and look and look at it in a good and and actually a life changing way because she was um, injured only a few months uh, into riding a uh, training to ride and she was injured. And her um, actually the connection to the, to the neck to the skull. So it was a very, very serious uh, thing. And uh, the vet told me I couldn't ride her for at least for a long while and it didn't heal well. So she kind of, you know, always um, been there in the background, even in my uh, when I taught riding, she she was just, you know, a horse. <laughs> And um, that actually kind of benefited our relationship. And I see it as a very, a very, um, a very important part of our relationship, uh, how close we are and our history together. So do I understand you correctly that you're that um, <clears throat> what you're saying is that not writing her? Uh, yeah, after, th- that's what benefited your relationship. I think so, because I could put her in the I had a writing school and I could have put it in it. So I couldn't, you know, I, I didn't work with her. I just, you know, I played around with her. Uh, liberty training was a thing for us, but but still it didn't damage the relationship as much as it damaged uh, other as training damaged uh, my other relationships with uh, the other horses. What kind do you remember back? What kinds of things you were doing with her at that time? And when you say for people who aren't horse oh, yeah. people, when um, you say liberty, could you kind of say what you mean by that too? Well, actually, uh, there was an agility course there, not an agility, like an obstacle course there that we practiced on. It was it was a, like light work. She was so curious. She, I just kept her curious. So that was fun to do with her. She, she wasn't scared of anything. And uh, I used to just uh, you bring her like a big yoga ball and play around a round pen with her, or just you know just be. Sometimes people forget this is why we we love horses. We want to be with them. And as a riding instructor, sometimes you don't take the time to just spend time with the horse you're working on. So Libby was like 
she was my way to, to, to bond in a different way. Very cool. So you've got your, and what's her name again? You just said it. Libby. 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 Okay. So you've got Libby and Chodo. Just the mayor. Yeah. (laughs) And who else are you living with now? Um, I got two ponies. Um, Billy was my second horse that I, uh, that I adopted. And he was actually, he has a, um, a story as well. He was a part of a big uh, herd of miniature horses. It's, it's like a big pony. He looks like a miniature, but he's a big pony. I'm not sure what breed he is. I don't really care. <laughs> so there was a, a big herd of ponies and he was an outcast. His, his, the, the, the breeding stallion there um, just, you know, resource guard him and just pushed him away from the herd. He got hurt a few times, so they isolated him. So they offered to me him instead of pay for this job I did. And I said, of course. <laughs> on the same day we met, I put a halter on him. I put him on an open wagon and we traveled home for like 20 minutes on an open road. That was amazing. But Billy is my second pony that joined the family. And then uh, he was lonely. So I got him a friend named Mickey. And Mickey is just like, uh, he's saying, uh, you, <laughs> I don't use it much in Hebrew, but it comes to my, it's a, to mind to talk about he's got chutzpah he's like how you (laughs) i usually describe a pony he escapes everything and when i met him when i went to to meet him he actually bucked me off and i told her i'm taking him yeah he's mine (laughs) so he's he's a, a really good friend of billy and just another there's toto that made a big change for me and our last edition was uh, Pooh. he's another miniature horse he's actually um related to toto same breeder and i adopted him from uh, a family um when he was in um actually um he was uh, in colicking for a week and uh, he needed emergency care so i took him in and uh, he had surgery and um, and then rehabilitation uh, at my ranch. And he's Toto's best friend, Hooligans. <laughs> and you have a couple of dogs in the mix as well. Is that right? Yes. Um, unfortunately, uh, a month ago, I had to I had to say goodbye to one dog. So now we're only two two dogs sleeping <laughs> right now. <laughs> Letting me interview. And um, they're totally different and they're big teachers here. Um, when I teach, uh, I teach, I like to incorporate horses and dogs and the big differences between them. So um, they're really different and they're amazing. One of them is called Moo, the sound of a cow. And the other one is Sheleg, which is snow in Hebrew. Very nice. Um, and that's that's all of the all of the animals? Right now, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I had some guests uh, that stayed for a while. Welcome to guests. <laughs> I, I, could you, I'm sure that everybody likes that too when you have guests. Um, they do well with <laughs> they, they do well with extras coming and staying. Um, actually, the guests that I had were um, free birds that just chose to stay for a while and, and follow me. So the first one was actually a hassle because my dogs did not like her. They wanted to eat her all the time and I had to separate between them. But actually, the second bird that I had uh, was a, uh, a pigeon that stayed for almost a year. So separating them was uh, was not, you know, not even not even something I could think of. So I actually got them to get along. So the pigeon thought it was a dog. It was always following around on the ground, but I made him um, approaching a good thing for the dog. So they they actually actually accepted him as a dog in the end. (laughs) Humans didn't, but the dogs did. (laughs) How long did that take for the dogs to become comfortable with the pigeon or were they from the beginning? I had to to work on it right away. I had to work on it right away because he was so, he just wanted to be around me all the time. Um, There was no contact in the beginning, but he he would come every afternoon and just nest on my head, on my shoulders, just wanted to be around me. But then he just stayed all day. He was like everywhere all day during the lessons, you know, following me to the bathroom, cooking with me. 
It was a challenge. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> he taught me a lot though. <laughs> so I'm sure that was an interesting, you said year, he was around for about a year. Almost a year. Yeah. That was, yeah. that was almost a year. Unbelievable. So you said that he taught you a lot. And then you also mm-hmm. mentioned him being around for the lessons. I know that you, oh, yeah. I know that you are teaching other people a lot. So could you kind of dig in a little bit and tell us all about the programming that you have going on at your facility, how all of that started, maybe some of the work that you did with Toto and then um, at the um, residential places that you visited, um, but then also what you're doing now at your place. So there's, there's like, a, I can, there's a timeline for it because it builds from something. So it begins with, with this miniature horse that came over when he was a fall. He was like four months old, just separated from his mom. And uh, he landed uh, at my door. It was a funny story, but <laughs> I want to focus on what happens from the moment he came. And um, it was really different for me. It was a, a dream com- coming true to have a horse that, you know, can get into the house and you can take him anywhere like a, like a dog. And I, I did. <laughs> I took him everywhere with me. I took him to the grocery store. I took him to the beach. I took him everywhere. But he couldn't stay with the, at the ranch with the horses. I used to have, uh, uh, I had at that time, I had uh, large horses and uh, even the ponies were too big for him. And he was actually always uh, sick. He was colicking. And so I had to have him um, around, you know, uh, close to me 24 seven. So he lived at the house. <laughs> It was such a, a great experience. It was such an, uh, an adventure. And I could see him learn all the time. I, I you know, he wasn't afraid of every, anything. We, he just walked around with the dogs and he was free to roam the house and the yard. And I used to just play with the dogs and, um, and train him to do tricks because uh, just for fun. Um, I think I already taught agility to the to the kids at my uh, lesson pro- uh, program at the ranch, but I don't think I I think I already worked with kids and taught them uh, working with treats, but not clicker training. And then um, and then one day um, when when I was playing with one of the dogs. Um, Toto did this amazing thing. And, and instead of one of the dogs doing a trick of me, um, you know, just uh, opening a space between my legs and and asking, where's Denny, my my uh, my dog? And then he would just pop his head between my legs and look up. So after watching Denny doing it for several times, just Toto just popped his head in <laughs> instead of Denny. And I was amazed. I actually gave him a dog treat. It was a problem for, for a long while afterwards. <laughs> he loves dog treats. And, um, but then I started, you know, exploring and that was the first time I saw horses have social learning and, uh, it just, you know, lit up a fire in me to try to explore that. And, um, and then, um, the fact that I could take him everywhere, I, I actually um, started going with them to kindergartens. Um, I loved working with kids because this is a, a job that I used to do where I would take uh, different animals and teach about that animal for a week in kindergartens. And I would keep the animal in my house and actually learn a lot about it while keeping it in the house for a week. Um, so I learned how to love working with kids. And, um, so I used to take him to get in gardens and teach them different things. I used to teach them that horses don't like to be touched on the nose and that Toto is going to approach them and, uh, he just dislikes touching. And, um, I taught them about, uh, what Toto's horses are afraid of and how they learn and how to approach him. And then uh, we used to show off his tricks. He's, he's, he learned how to generalize everything I, t- I taught him uh, to every scenario and with screaming kids and, you know, <laughs> and, you know um, loud noises and running kids just running around. Uh, you know, I, I did my best to keep them seated, but still there were a lot of times where I was amazed 
of how calm and collected. And he used to, you know, sometimes pin their his ears and just tell them, sit down. No, don't move here. I'm working. But uh, mainly he was just always comes back to me and he was never uh, stressed or afraid. So I was I felt I was um, I could do this with him, you know, and uh, he always uh, used to you know, uh, get on the trailer and seconds, you know, let's go. He used to watch me harness the trailer. He's like, where are we going? It was a, always a good experience for him. I think because he got a lot more treats than usual <laughs> when we are, you know, it was like constant feeding him uh, before we had duration. And um, uh, it was fun time. And that's how I got to fund the other horses most of the time when we didn't have a place of our own to work and teach so but um from from there on um sometimes after the kindergartens i i took the i took the opportunity to go visit my dad my dad was uh, at a home he he had dementia already at um later stages where he lost uh the ability to speak and he had uh two strokes already and was uh, he had a paralyzed side so I used to take Toto uh, with me and visit him and play with him. So my dad, as I mentioned, had a love for animals just as much as I did. So it was uh, like a big connection for us. And he loved horses as well. So the fact that I could take a horse and go to his home was amazing. And the fact that they let me, <laughs> because it's not very known here that you can take a horse to get into a home. And um, and then as soon as other uh, patients saw what I'm doing with my dad, they all came out and it, it turned out to be like a group thing. And I had so much fun. So I approached this local facility here uh, for mental disabilities and and different patients, different disability, you know, different uh, cognitive and um, physical uh, abilities and I took Toto and they let me explore that there which was amazing because Toto Toto actually invented so many things he taught me so many things about how horses think and um, I don't know if I can mention all of them <laughs> can I <laughs> Shelly <laughs> go for it yes <laughs> <laughs> so so there's a few games I utilize um, to create this um Space between the patient and Toto to allow them to get used to his presence without getting scared of him because he's a miniature horse, but he's he's big, you know. For them, they're sitting down most uh, most of the time in chairs or uh, wheelchairs, and um, so when he approaches, he comes, you know, he comes with the ball or something. So I taught him how to pick up a ball and bring it to patients. And the thing is that I, I just stand in the middle of this big hall. There's around 30 patients sometimes. So I feel like I'm actually worked like a, a medical clown for some sort. So I was like happy, happy, joy, joy all the time. And Toto worked by himself. He picked up the ball after somebody threw him the ball, picked up the ball and brought it to someone else. Sometimes he just picked, you know, sometimes he was looking for outreach hands to know where to go or because they have this, you know, horses, uh, the fun fact that they can see me when I'm behind them. Um, I always teach people that look as uh, horses look at our, at our eyeballs because we're fortunate to have eyeballs that they're so uh, that animals can understand easily because he can see where I'm looking. So I'm actually can direct him while I'm behind him, which is amazing. I don't know if you can do it with a dog. I never worked with a dog <laughs> in, in a therapy session like this, but um, that was amazing that he could do that. And he actually, in order to gain success, he actually saw when, um, when patients couldn't reach out and get the ball, he used to reach out to them and get the ball to their hands. Sometimes um, there were spastics uh, where they couldn't outreach and he just brought them straight to them to their palm to create success. So that was amazing. And there was different wheelchairs and different approaches. So I used to uh, play with balls and um, basketball was a big thing when they hold the actual a board for him to to dunk the ball in or play the, the piano with them 
and they would take turns to play t- piano. So I would encourage them to play as well. And they they love how predictable I was because it was the same games uh, every time I came. So predictability was a good thing. You know, they loved it. You know, music time, you know, and all the all the instruments are coming out and you know, sort of play the uh, play the like a bell and and a lot of instruments. So they love them. They they love it. So we did that for a few years till um, they closed access for us uh, uh, during the pandemic, unfortunately. And ever since then, we've been to visit, but unfortunately, budget wise, we can't go back. But um, now we have a space for our own, so I can take in patients here, which is. Which is nicer for Toto, for sure. I know he liked it, but still, home is home, so it's preferable. So we don't do kindergartens anymore, and and now we just you know teach people at home. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? About the teaching that you're doing at home yes. with people? So um, Toto has been like uh, this uh, behavioral experiment for me. So I taught him a lot, and then um, I actually um, got into the ATA group and started listening to lectures and doing the courses. I think the fact that I couldn't go and actually study this uh, professionally due to lack of time or funds because I had to, I had a lot of horses and dogs to, <laughs> to take care of and a business to work. And it's always been a struggle. Uh, it's been 10 years since I've been um, independent with my horses and dogs, and it's always been a struggle. So making that transfer from um, classical uh, classical training, all my other horses, and moving that to clicker training, all of them, took a while. It took a few years to do that, that switch. And uh, slowly but surely now, <laughs> Um, everybody, uh, all of them are clicker trained and happy and, but it took a while, but the kids actually helped me. Um, the actual project was to teach them everything. So my school became a school for teachers. I, I, I actually see them as me training teachers, or sometimes I kill their, uh, I call them kindergarten teachers. <laughs> I have this lesson with that you have to work. I used to have three dogs and sometimes I tell them, okay, you're the, you're the kindergarten teacher today. You got three dogs to work with. And, um, and then they would have to pay attention to all three. And, um, and actually uh, I would challenge them to take one for an assignment while the other two are waiting and how to improve their observ- observational uh, skills and, and how they can see uh, one inside a group. And th- that's amazing. And we do it with the horses now as well. So um, like, uh, but the, the the kids really help me teach uh, most of the behaviors that the horses know. And it's been six, six years, I think, since we started clicker training the horses. And each of them have a, their own pace or likes or dislikes, but um, they, they, they dabble in everything. It, it sounds like an amazing project. And it was kind of cool for me to hear you saying that uh, if I understood correctly, that you're kind of um, like many people struggling access, accessing resources that you needed to kind of develop your skills. And then you found ATA, which had some lectures and things that could help you. And now you're able to, just like the name of this show, Making Ripples, you're able to spread those ripples to these children and create um uh, it creates such wonderful skills in the next generation. Um, and the last time we met, I know I can't see it now and nobody else will be able to see it. But the last time we met, you stood up and you walked your camera around and you oh. showed me the setup at your facility. Mm-hmm. And I was just floored by the antecedent arrangements that you have in place to set these children and these animals up for success. And I wonder if you might be able to kind of just, just describe your setup a little bit and what that classroom is like for people. Yes. um, Actually, the predictability part that we talked about at the home is something that resonates everywhere with the horses and with the kids. So when the kids come over to the ranch, they have the whole ranch to themselves, by the way. Um, They come over, they rush to this uh, board and on the board, 
they can actually see their their name and uh, who's uh, which animal they're working with. So every week they come over and they do expect that one of the, you know, every week there's a horse lesson and the next week would be a dog lesson. So they do because I wanted them to work with everyone and um, not wanting to create this um, thing when one student just wants to work with one horse. It's like it's a given thing that every week you work with a different horse. And uh, with a different animal. And then um, they get to the, the ex- excitement of starting. They actually try to guess who is they going to, who are they going to work with? And then they discover who, and then they have this um, a little setup area where they have to organize themselves. I, I, you know, I teach them how to do it in the beginning and I, I, I'm always there for them. But I want them to gain independence uh, while arranging their their lesson. So they have to pick um, like a pouch, like a treat pouch. There's different for dogs and horses. And then every every animal have this jar with the treats for the day. So we know he actually has to put the treats in and everything. And then pick a target stick. I have this fun target sticks. Is my one of my the fun thing to do is make or find target sticks. They are fun for not just kids. They're fun for me. Everything that's fun for me, it's fun for kids. I'm as enthusiastic or even more enthusiastic about these stuff more than the kids in the end. I just made a new one with tassels and everything, a new target stick. And so they're 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 actually it's kind of I think my enthusiasm for the thing is actually very um, mirroring, you know, as soon as they see how excited I am about getting ready and what colors to pick and what clicker to choose and how we plan the lesson afterwards, they're getting excited about that too. And there's this whiteboard uh, that we can plan the lesson. There's actual steps that, that can draw the 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 shaping plan for the day but it's not always teaching it's sometimes just reversing um known cues or and it depends on the skill of the of of my of my students or they're you know i always adapt the to set them up for success i always give them things that they can do that in their range of um abilities to set them up for success. But, um, and then we start the lesson and it's 30 minutes, but because it's pretty intense for the animal and because for the kids, mainly because the animals just want to continue forever. <laughs> but I, I pumped it in their brain that they're teachers, you know, so they take responsibility, not only for what they teach, but we talk about emotions all the time and how our learners are coping with, with the teaching and how um, I always ask them which which teacher they like in school. And it's the one that likes their subject and it's the one that lights a fire in them for the subject. So I think teaching is my main passion in life. And it's always has been uh, just different things. I love teaching and I love being creative. Uh, there's actually a Muppet that I made from uh, a horse head Muppet that they, the kids or just, you know, everybody can train on that Muppet. It's a full size miniature horse head that they can train with a target stick and they can um, uh, train themselves uh, to the just the basic skills of uh, not very basic, but very important skills of how to deliver the food and the, the reinforcements and the safe way with the horses to do so. And um, I can reenact uh, how start buns look like or or just everything. It's really fun. I take it around with me. I took it on the train <laughs> to, to this lecture I had at this uh, horse stable. So 
uh, I train, I, I work with it all the time. It's really fun. It, it sounds like a lovely program and it's really um, awesome to see all the thought that you've put into it and how you split everything down to set everybody up for success. Uh, I really enjoyed getting the getting the tour uh, the last time <laughs> that we met and I appreciate you kind of walking everybody through some of what that looks like now. Um, for I could ask you a million questions about this program and about the horses who you live with and the children who you work with. But for the sake of time, I think that we'll move on to our next question, um, which might have us talking about some of this stuff still. I'm not sure, but I would love it if you could now tell us about a recent training related challenge that you've experienced and how you worked through it or you are working through it and some of the lessons you're learning from it or have learned from it. For sure. I think I want to add something to the school that for uh, before it kind of relates to um to what we're going to talk to next but i really want to talk about this and how i can incorporate cooperative care into into everyday um into the lessons because um we didn't speak about this but the the kids usually teach agility or you know trick training like uh, playing with toys uh, to make it fun for them because they don't train the horses to ride at all here at, at my ranch so it's just um, but my favorite thing is how I teach kids, uh, cooperative care. My horses have this, uh, speech button that the kids know that they have to ask for permission. Um, uh, all the, all the horses are, um, knowledgeable would start ones, but not all of them know how to press the speech button. Uh, but then they ask him, can I, can I, can I, you know, brush you Toto? And he presses the button and says, yes, in Hebrew, of course. And then they start brushing him while watching him. And, uh, and then they actually count. I teach them to count out the, the time and they click and treat. And then we build, we talk about duration and we build that. But cooperative care is one of my favorite things to teach kids because it changes the conversation. That teaches really, uh, that really teaches observ observational skills in terms of uh, horse um, uh, um, body language and facial expressions. So one of my favorites, that's it. I think that's great. And I'm so glad that you hopped back to uh, talk about that and add that. And I think another thing that is really wonderful about teaching cooperative care work with other animals to children is that it can also um, translate into greater lessons about consent in general. Exactly. I wanted to, yeah, to say that because uh Consent in general is, is it's the first thing that comes to mind because when they walk in the ranch, the dogs just reach out. You know, they walk to the to the car. Even they they walk with the kids, and that's the first thing I teach them because when they first walk in, I meet them at the at the where the car is parked to teach them how to approach my dogs. One of my dogs doesn't like to be petted. So I feel like an, I'm an advocate and I can't, I don't, I try to set, like, I love um, airless learning, especially in that part. I, I won't make my horses or dogs tolerate something. Before I, I make a point to teach that as the first thing, consent, consent for touch and, and why they approach that way and how it looks like when they say no. And I, I love how I explain it to kids. It's very easy to make them understand because all I need to do is offer a hug. They don't know me. They wouldn't want a hug. So I show them they do, they do really small uh, suggestive avoidance behavior. And as soon as they can notice that in them, they would look for it in an animal. So it's the first thing they, they learn when they walk through my, my door or not even the door. <laughs> next to the car. But yeah, it's the first thing they have to learn here is consent. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's just great. There's so many lessons there for um, how to uh, respect other people's needs and wishes and also how to create our own boundaries around those yes. sorts of things. So that's that's wonderful. Um, so thank you for adding that. Uh, so now let's hear about that training related challenge. Mm, yes. 
So when, when we first talked about it, a, a few things came to mind, but, but the two major behaviors that I'm very, very, um, there were a, a big challenge for me, you know, uh, moving into training, uh, clicker training and with utilize positive reinforcement doesn't mean that I could keep my horses safe from stress because there was always stress around uh, the gate. The horses noticed the kids were coming. The lessons are every afternoon. So every time a car came by or there were any suggestions of the lessons coming, uh, they would go to the gate and they would fight to go in. Everybody wanted to come in to play. Nobody wanted to get out, especially when there's four other horses that are waiting outside, but wanted to go in. And that was a big stressor for me. That was, you know, lessons were every 30 minutes and there was always this horrible uh, delay of me trying to fight one out and bring one in while the others are, you know, just, you know, throwing food around everywhere in bowls. So, and I saw other people doing stationing, but I didn't know how to do it. I, I couldn't even fathom how I could feed everyone without my mare just kicking everybody around and taking all their food. So, and actually I even uh, I called to pick Peggy Hogan's brain and Anatsha Lev's brain. And we're, we're, they were so generous uh, with information. I'm very lucky to have them. Uh, and Anatsha is a friend and they're a farmer experienced. And uh, I can learn a lot from them. So I call them and um, and I, I they were I were taught the process and working with uh, with two horses and then three horses and then switching uh, couples and working with all the horses um, in you know in in groups and adding more horses. But it just, you know, it looked like such an, a big ordeal for me, <laughs> time consuming. And I, I didn't really think I have the abilities to do it. I, I worked with two or three horses, mainly with the miniaturist, but I felt I wasn't feeling safe to do so. So, but last year I was able to um, watch the Clicker Expo. And of course, I wanted to watch uh, Peggy Hogan's and Anat and Monty's um, demonstrations. So I was glued to that. And then from their demonstrations, I could pick and choose some stuff. And I made up a way for me to teach all five horses stationing at the same time. And that was a big, big, huge win for me. Such such win that right now, is, I think it's the thing that I'm most proud of, of uh, in terms of teaching behavior. All the stress is gone. You know, I actually, I do it every day. This is how I feed the horses. If they don't have lessons, we bartend. This is how I call the game, the bartender game. And uh, there, I love the steps in it and they're they're so I love I'm so proud of them and their choices and even uh, even if one gets off the mat or is a little bit upset sometimes uh, they don't how they handle that stress and how they um, they found the, the right answer really fast or I just you know control my composure and not I'm not, I'm not afraid anymore they're not there there's no stress anymore. And that made such a huge impact on everything. Um, even with the, the fixed hierarchy around food, um, the last one that came in that herd poo, the little miniature horse is always the last one to get to the new hay when I put the new hay nets and everything. And, um, or he's the last one to, to station. Now he, he gets to push himself between my mare and my, my large pony. It's like his, his um, self-confidence is skyrocketing, you know, and even the one pony had still had um, um, resource guarding issues while well, training as well with big movements and, and, uh, and everything, everything is solving, you know, everything, everything, it's just, it fixed everything. It's amazing. And right now I am able to just ask them to just station and I'm telling one horse, okay, you have lesson, come in. And he just runs around, he comes into gates. And then I pay everyone for, thank you, thank you for staying and giving me 
you know, not having a hard time with you and, and just then go and start the lesson. So that, that was a big thing for me. And I thank Peggy and Anat and, and all the inspiration I get from other trainers and their experience. Very thankful. It's so fun for me to hear you talk through that. And I'm sure it is for the audience as well to listen to the kind of shift from this um, more kind of, I guess, what we might label a stressed out sort of emotional space to hearing you talk. You sound joyful now in describing. Oh, yes. uh... yeah. <laughs> so it's wonderful for me to hear that. Um, and, and I also also get the pleasure of seeing your face as you're talking about mm, it too. Yes. <laughs> so I see all of those expressions as well. Um, so proud what, mommy expression. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what were some of your biggest, what do you think some of your biggest learning takeaways were from that experience? Mainly, um, I think how I believe I can do something like my, my belief system and my abilities sometimes, I think I, I sometimes like confidence in my training and I have to remind myself that there's always a way. You just have to be really, really creative. There's always a way. And um, and when you get that way, it's so exciting when you get that breakthrough. You know, um, there was it was in this challenge in one behavior. Pooh, my miniature horse has been it's been a while. He's been with me for six years now, so he's not very new. And playing ball is, is a very important, uh, playing with the ball, picking it up and bringing it to, to your hands is a very important skill here because sometimes uh, when I work with kids in protected contact, they play with the ball um, behind a window. So this is one of the things I need them to do to, to be able to work with the small kids as well, not just the big kids. And um for the life of me, for five years, I couldn't get him to 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 keep the ball in his in his mouth for more than a split second. I couldn't I couldn't click it. I couldn't. I, and there were other trainers that that came over and tried to to train it, and nobody and different strategies and back chaining and everything. Nobody nobody managed so. But then I think uh, another ATA lecture, sometimes I just, I watch an ATA lecture and then it boosts something, you know, I get so inspired and he's like, I can sell this, but you know, it fits somewhere. Um, and so I, I don't remember which one, I don't remember which one. Oh, I think it was Mary Hunter's one um, with the second behavior ending the first behavior. Uh, amazing Mary thank you Mary as well <laughs> from the group I met her through the group so yes and um, so I threw a bunch of balls into the classroom with Pooh and I knew he would pick up the ball and I uh, actually um, placed food in a bowl next to me but I every time he had to go out and touch a ball and pick up a ball and then come back for the reinforcement. So and I was outside. So I took out all my body language out and all other uh, things that could, uh, you know, remind him of the old behavior that I clicked like a thousand times and I don't know how to track back. So of him throwing the ball away uh, anywhere. So and then by using his laziness. He said, why do I have to go and pick the ball all, all the time really far away? So I got to capture him picking up the ball and walking with him back to get the reinforcement. So I created the duration of walking with the ball in a whole different way, using um, the uh, food delivery as as one of the shaping component, you know, and uh, that he have to come back and get the reinforcement. And then from then, the kids took it, and he's one of the best basketball players now. So, and it was just like a hurdle that I, I was really stuck on. And again, creativity and knowledge and experience, just, you know, everything works, everything clicked in the end. So that's the two I'm really proud of. The harder the conflict, the glorious, the triumph, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and I can really relate to that too, and I'm sure others can too, just kind of getting stuck 
stuck on something with yeah. our own, uh, with the animals who were the closest to. And especially that in both of the examples, I can relate to them. But I'm thinking back to that first one and all that kind of emotion that I heard kind of tied up in there as far as being yes. stressed, you know, and um, that can be such a block sometimes as far as how to move forward. So it's really cool to me to hear how you uh, had the braveness to reach out to Peggy Hogan um, and and Anat. Yeah, Anat, Anat actually, I'm grateful she's here in Israel and she's a friend. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I pick her brains. Uh, I used to pick her brain more. Uh, now I just, you know, I watch everything she does and, and I keep, um, yeah, I keep posted with all the latest. I try. <laughs> Super cool that you were able to reach out to both of them and also glean things from their online resources, whether those be yes. things from the ATA membership or like you said, Clicker Expo. And then that, yes. uh, you know, taking advantage of what Mary Hunter had to offer there in the ATA lecture. And sometimes I think just getting stuck with the problems we're closest to. To, when yes. we don't have the confidence like you were talking about just sometimes just whether it's reaching out individually or just accessing those materials and supports online yes is experience is a big thing and and there's a, a small a really small community here in israel so unfortunately so i i'm so grateful for this community um, that makes me feel not alone, not alone in this. And somebody that can celebrate my success, uh, like here is like being, you know, a validation for my peers, if you might say, is, is really reinforcing for me because sometimes you feel all alone. And, um, yeah, the, the ATA group has been a really big family for me, even though I'm not, uh, you know, uh, enthusiastic, uh, writer there. I read a lot and, and watch everything. And, uh, sometimes I have the, even the confidence to give my own, uh, my own experience, uh, in there. So it's pretty fun. Well, I'm glad you have the confidence to give your own experience yeah. here with us today, because <laughs> I think it's really going to resonate with a lot of people. I know it certainly does with me. And um, we're lucky to have your have your voice and have your ripples being spread throughout the throughout the community in the world. Um, so you kind of touched on a couple of them in the questions that we just answered. And we, but we have a little bit of time left. If you have anything else mm -hmm. that you wanted to share about uh, maybe what's next? Yeah, go for it. Tell us what what is next for you? Yeah, I love I love my job, but uh, I found lately in the past few years I saw how uh, even while I'm teaching the kids, the parents are usually around. So sometimes they report to me how listening in to my lesson with the kids kind of made a difference of how they see. Um, they change their perspective about how they talk to their kids or, or at home um, or just a, a shift in perspective. So I, I really started to... Uh, to start to build programs that are fitted to adults, not just adults, but different types. I've, I've been doing lectures lately to dog trainers, even um, therapy dog trainers, and improving their skill sets. Just uh, talking about um, animal emotions and uh, how, and actually uh, teaching about how I teach um, and how I work with with my animals and with the kids. So, so I'm trying to break through that barrier because everybody knows me as a, a, that I'm good with kids and I know how to teach kids clicker training in, in creative ways and that I love it, but I love lecturing. This is um, in the past, uh, I think um, three years, I've been taking the uh, Carolina Whistland's uh, courses. And I think more than anything, She's the she's the best teacher I've ever encountered. <laughs> and I love her teaching style and how she got she gets me all enthusiastic in in two minutes of talking. So and I found that I love doing it by my I, I love doing it as well. So I've been starting to lecture people and a few ranches have opened the door for me to come in and and talk about how they can improve welfare not even by clicker training. I taught them how to scratch their horses and explore uh, positive reinforcement in a different way and how to spend time with them. 
and uh, bringing up um, emotions and in, in a way that doesn't uh, drive them away from what I do, uh, uh, but opens up uh, a, diff- a different, a, a new perspective about what they, their horses really need uh, in order to be happy. So I call it how to uh, get close to the ones you love. And not just the animals, but the skill set you gain from learning how to bond with animals and and get close to the ones you love uh, actually helps you get close to humans. So I'm hoping to make an impact there with uh, with adults now. So I actually cut down my kids' lessons to do this. So I'm hoping this will work. <laughs> well, that's really exciting. I'll be anxious and um, looking forward to seeing how all of that goes for you and how Thank you're you. able to continue to develop that. I'm sure that you will come up with some creative and fun ways to keep spreading ripples further and further. Yeah, they're just big kids. Adults are just big kids. <laughs> Same <Yes>. tools. <laughs> this is very true. I know I am certainly a big kid. I'm yeah. still waiting to grow up. I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> Me too. I gave up on that, that idea like a long time ago. Well, Michaela, thank you so much um, for joining us today. And um Please accept my sincere apology. I am pretty sure I just said your name wrong again. No, it's okay. <laughs> we talked. We were talking about that before the show. Um, yeah. So, uh, can you, Michaela? Michaela, yeah. Okay, Michaela. there we go. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we. Before we leave, though, um, could you please share with everybody how they can find you? And we'll link to all of this in the show notes as well. But for people who are just listening, if you could share with folks how they could find you if they wanted to reach out. So I have my own um, a Facebook page for the ranch. I admit I should share more uh, more there uh, regarding training, but uh, you can see a lot of videos and fun things there. Um, so there's a Michelina Ranch. I called my ranch Michelina because this is uh, like a, how I was called when I was really young. It's like a you know a pet name. How do you say that? <laughs> That's it. That's how you say it. Endearment, yeah, like a term of it. And um, so Michelina was uh, like owning a ranch and having horses was like a a childhood dream. So I called it that. But mainly um, now I found myself kind of distancing from that name because I found that um, compassionate communication with animals seems bigger bigger for me as like a, as a concept and not just you know my wrench or my dream coming true so you can find me as michelina ranch but uh you can always find the tag of uh, compassionate communication with animals i also have a youtube um page that you can uh, each even find a lot of uh, videos of the pigeon or the the other birds that you know came into my life and stayed for for periods of time and that's it and my private page as well of course wonderful well, thank you so much and um like i mentioned we will link to all of that in the show notes as well thank you so much from myself oh, thank you. on behalf of ata on behalf of everyone listening i'm really really grateful and we are too thank you very much for joining us we do of course appreciate all of you tuning in as well And if you have enjoyed this episode and are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with the animals in our lives in the most positive, most fun, and most choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.atamember.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode, though. Thank you so much for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.